Good morning, everyone. It is great to have you in the house of the Lord. We're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer and go right into our first song. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that we can gather together to worship you, to exalt you. And Lord, we just pray that our worship to you would be pleasing. Lord, we just pray Lord, that you would just calm our hearts and our minds, that we would focus upon you. Lord, we pray against any distractions in this place today, but that we would just focus on worshiping you. We give you praise and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to stand with us, we know that Jesus is coming back someday. It could Amen. be today. Amen? Amen? Are you excited that he could be coming back today? None of you are excited that Jesus is coming back. Okay. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King soon and very soon, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King, soon and very soon, we are going to see the King, hallelujah. Hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, 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 we're going to see the King. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm looking forward to that day. I think Bill is. Is anybody else? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. Turn and greet one another before you're seated. I know if you were going to go see King Charles III, you'd be excited and this is even more exciting. <laughs> Sir? It is great to have you all in the house of the Lord today. If you have not done so, please silence your phones. And so we don't have any interruptions during the service. And we'll turn it over to the pastor for some announcements. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Good morning. <laughs> I would like to ask you to take out your bulletin with me. If you have a bulletin, take it out so we can follow along. And I'm hoping you remember some of the things going on. You know, 9-11 Sunday, and it's 9-11, and it is Sunday. And we're going to be doing our ministry to the first responders uh, following the service. The outreach ministry team heads that up. And we need to pray for, our, of course, all of our first responders, which I'll bring up a little bit uh, later on. I want to highlight a few special announcements, though, and I want to make sure I don't miss anything. We have a special administrative council meeting tomorrow night at 6 p.m., you know, if you're on one of our ministry teams, spiritual life, outreach, Christian education, or stewardship, if you are on one of the ministry teams, you are also on administrative council. Uh, administrative council meets monthly and or before business meetings. Tomorrow night's meeting at 6 p.m. is to meet with 
uh, to talk about some of the church finances and meet with the person who um, is in charge of our investments. So that's a, just a brief, very informal meeting at 6 p.m. If you're on council, please come to that meeting if you can. The other thing tomorrow night, we have a new, a new ministry team called Worship Design Team. And we're talking about the worship service, not just with music, but skits and, and drama and uh, many other aspects of the worship service. And, and we'll be meeting tomorrow at, si- at 7 p.m., at 7 p.m., the worship design team. On the top of your bulletin insert that looks like this, it says we need a list of volunteers who can help people with transportation to church on Sundays. We have a sign up in the narthex. If you can help um, with people who cannot drive themselves, people who no longer drive, please sign up if you can or let me know. It'd be very helpful. We want to be able to help people get to worship. Um, We are also starting potlucks, and last week I said they're going to be the first and third Sunday. We're going to change that to the third Sunday for now. Once a month, third Sunday for now. Hopefully the goal is to go to first and third Sunday. Next Sunday there's going to be a potluck again. So please bring a dish to share. It's very informal, and we just want to encourage fellowship around food. And it's always easier to fellowship around food. Food. It's always good to fellowship around food, and we had a great one last Sunday, so please stay for that if you can. The other thing is next Sunday night at 6 p.m., Susan Laird will be here speaking. Susan Laird uh, teaches on human trafficking at the uh, Youngstown State University. She's also a, a counselor. She spoke in Sunday school, and we invited her to speak again, and this is open to the community. We've advertised it to the community in various ways. Please come and support that if you can. We'll have a light a light uh, like dessert reception afterwards. Um, The other thing I guess I want to announce, or just at least one more thing, is that we we will be starting a memorial fund in honor of John Raymond. So if you'd like to donate to that fund, mark your offering accordingly. There's um, offering envelopes in the pews, and you can mark it on the offering envelopes or or another way. But the memorial fund uh, in honor of John Raymond. And I think that's all the announcement. I guess I'm going to announce one other thing. And I was questioning whether to announce it, but I am. Next Sunday's Youth Sunday. And the reason I was questioning it, Youth Sunday is always a good thing. We want to encourage, please come out and support the youth. Uh, but sometimes when the pastor's away, the people stay away. And I don't know why people would do that. Because the pastor, I can say, I preach most of the Sundays out of the year. And studies will show even the best public speakers can only speak, well, 8 to 12 times a year. In fact, I read about a TED Talk on public speaking. And it said, once you perfect your speech, you can give it repeatedly all year round. And we're doing it every Sunday. So when when the pastor's away, you get somebody who can really prepare, you know, and not saying I don't really prepare. I think I do. But anyways, it's, it's Youth Sunday. It's a special Sunday. Please don't stay away when I'm away, and definitely don't stay away on Youth Sundays. They're, they're going to be giving uh, testimonies, and they're going to be leading worship, and it's going to be a really, really good Sunday. Uh, they do it once a year, so please come out and support the youth for Youth Sunday next Sunday. At this time, I would like to uh, lead us in prayer before we continue in the worship service. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now. What an awesome time it is to worship you. It is sacred to worship you. And as I just talked about Youth Sunday, I know, I believe, next in the service is the children leading us in a couple songs. And how sacred that is. Anytime we can worship you, and anytime we can include children and or youth in, lead us, in leading us in worship. Lord God, you are awesome. You really are an awesome God. May that never be something that we just say lightly. In a way, Lord God, we should say it with fear and trepidation. You are awesome. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all glory. You are worthy of all honor. So much so that the devil has always, and the dark forces, 
have always wanted to take from you. And we remember the Holy Spirit is within us. And we worship you. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we worship you in this very, very sacred time, this sanctified time, this time that's set apart, that's consecrated for you. So we continue to worship you. Be glorified and please be exalted. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
anybody feel like polking on that song? <laughs> that was awesome. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. Kids did a great job. Uh, in Christ, the solid rock I stand, if you're able to stand with us. Our hope should only be in Jesus. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Every eye and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand His oath is covenant and his blood Support me in the whelming flood gives way, even is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh my heaven, in him be found. In his righteousness alone, all blessings and before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Could we sing the fourth verse again, Ken? The fourth verse. I just think those words are very fitting. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You may be seated, but that verse, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless I stand before the throne. Amen. What a wonderful and meaningful hymn. As we continue in worship, and as we do continue in worship, uh, we're going to go uh, forward in prayer here in just a second. I want to share other, a few other prayer needs. Uh, we want to continue to pray for the Fogolsky and the Wade family as uh, Warren went home to be with his Lord and Savior uh, last Wednesday morning, and memorial service is here tomorrow at 11 a.m. There will be calling hours here from 10 until uh, just before 11 in the morning again. Calling hours are at Fox Funeral Home today from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the afternoon as well. So please keep that in mind, and we'll keep all of their family and the Wade family in prayer as well. Let's continue to pray for Lisa Fink as she continues to get the best treatment and medication for her back. And you probably saw on Friday she was in the, or Thursday night, Thursday night in the emergency room. And I know she's following up with her doctors this week. We need to keep Lisa Fink in prayer. And um, we need to pray for Harper. Harper's, uh, you've seen the prayer chains, I'm sure. She's a little six-year-old girl who comes to our Friends Club, and her grandmother uh, comes to our Bible study and worship service. And Harper went to the hospital on Wednesday night, Akron Children's in Boardman, then was sent to Akron Children's in Akron. She's not been eating uh, much or hardly anything for weeks, and she's uh, malnourished and is having um, 
many complications because of that, and they're trying to get to the root cause of it, but also deal with the effects of not eating. So please pray for Harper, Harper's mother, um, Macy, um, great-grandmother Cheryl, who, Mayhu, who comes here, and those treating her. And of course, uh, we'll take this time also to pray for first responders. Uh, yes. Yeah, Chris. Good. Oh, Yes. Come. Yeah, so that's celebratory, and I and I want to uh, repeat that for those that couldn't hear or those online. We were praying for Audrey, uh, Chris's daughter, who's pregnant, and uh, they th- thought they found something on the brain. And praise God, she saw the neonatal and the specialist, and there was nothing there. So praise God. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks for um, I should have shared that. So I'm pr- glad you shared that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord God, you are the solid rock, or Jesus, you are the solid rock on whom we stand. Lord God, and I was reminded of Hymn 36, no one understands like Jesus. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. He is waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus when the days are dark and grim. No one is so near. So dear is Jesus, cast your every care on him. No one understands like Jesus every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly he whispers comfort in the broken heart he heals. No one understands like Jesus when the foes of life assail. You should never be discouraged. Jesus cares and will not fail. No one understands like Jesus when you falter on the way. Though you fail him, sadly fail him, he will pardon you today. Lord Jesus, we know that you are dear, you are near, you are close, you care. You care for us and you have adopted us into your family. And we can cry out to you, Abba, Father. We come to you right now, O Lord God, and On the 21st anniversary of 9-11, that tragic day in America's history. And twenty-one years later, we can all give testimony of how you've continued to take care of us and provide and provide for our country in many ways, but knowing also that many people continue to hurt because they had great, great, great losses on that day. We pray for our men and women in uniform. We thank you for them. We pray, Lord God, that you would keep them safe and protect their families. We pray for our our first responders. Paramedics, EMTs, police, firefighters. We thank you, Lord God, for them. For when we sleep at night, they're available and they're out and about providing for the various needs. Keep them safe and give them wisdom and guidance and knowledge and peace. Guide their families as well. And use them to represent you. Lord God, we pray for those in need right now. Our hearts ache for Harper and her family. We pray for Cheryl. We pray for her mother, Macy. And certainly we pray for Harper. We pray, Lord God, that they can get to the root cause of this and get to the counseling help, the medical help, the physiological help needed and provide healing in the mean and give her the nutrients needed as they also try to counsel the anxiety and things that she's going through. We pray for Harper's healing. We pray your comfort, care, and peace upon the Fogolsky family, the Wade family, and all the rest of them. We just lift them all up to you. We pray your peace and comfort. We thank you that Warren is with you in heaven right now. Lord God, we also do pray 
for Lisa Fink. She's part of the body here of Christ at Bethel Friends. And if one suffers, we all suffer. I think I speak for all of us that we all hurt for her. We miss her. We cannot imagine the pain that she's going through and been going through for so long. We pray, Lord God, that you would touch her body and that you would heal her back. We actually pray that you'd miraculously touch her and heal her. And though I hate to say the if, if you choose not to do it that way, we pray that you would get her to the right specialist and provide a healing solution and help the medications to work. We pray for Lisa's healing and we pray for Carl too. We pray for the others in need, many, many, many more in need right now. We dedicate today's offering to you, and we, Lord God, give you praise, and we celebrate that Audrey's baby is healthy, whether there was nothing there to begin with or whether you healed the little baby. We celebrate, and we give you praise and thanks. Lord God, thank you for the gospel. Please, Lord God, continue to use us to spread the gospel. May we continue to worship you, glorify you, and exalt you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord just continues to lay upon my heart of just being thankful for the things that he does each and every day. I think we take so many things for granted that the Lord provides for us just the breath, the air that we breathe each and every day. And I was thinking about, um, I like to go to Niagara Falls. And um, one of the things that, that, that struck me that I find very interesting is if you go out on Three Sisters Island or that, that you have birds that are just sitting in the water a few hundred feet from going over the falls, just floating in the water, just not a care in the world, you know, that they could just float on down the river and go right over the falls. Now it is a bird and it could fly away. But just, just the peace that it seems that the birds are enjoying in that area as, as the waves or the, the current is, is going on by, they find a little area. And the Lord does that for us. In the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the turmoil, God will give us peace if we submit to him but we have to submit to him. And as we sing this song, 10,000 Reasons, you know, I, I challenged uh, the congregation, what was it, last year, two years ago, about a thankful list. You know, I don't know if you were able to come up with 100 things, but this is talking about 10,000 reasons why we should be thankful. And as we sing this, just let the things go through your mind that you're thankful for. And if you're able to stand with us as we sing this. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. To sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy. Like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. 
a thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. Lord, I'll worship your holy name. And Lord, we do worship your holy name. Lord, not for all of the blessings, but because you are worthy. You are almighty God, and there is none that is greater, and we worship you. We pray your blessings upon our pastor as he brings today's message. Lord, may our hearts and our minds be open to receive from you today. and We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Children may be dismissed to junior church. I think they just stayed in junior church. But if you haven't gone to junior church and you are under fifth grade or so, you're welcome to find junior church. Generally, they know the way. Um, we're going to be going to Matthew 19 here in a minute. You know, as Steve was uh, leading that song and um, praying right afterwards, Reminded me, I was listening to a podcast called The White Horse Inn, which was a place where the Reformation broke out in England. And I was listening to it this morning, and they were talking about the creation narratives, which they're going to be talking about for several weeks. And when you study the ancient, the other ancient Near East creation myths, we realize how much God was speaking out uh, to them and against them, showing that the Lord God, the God of Israel, is not just a tribal deity. He's not just a local deity. He reigns supreme over everything. And it also connects to how there's a place in Job where it says it, um, the Lord throws the javelin at one of the ancient Near Eastern creatures. And the name of what it was escapes me, but it's saying, you know, the Lord is greater you know, than any other power. And they could not fathom, and neither can we, how great, how great, how awesome the Lord is. I was reminded of it yesterday. Um, we had men's breakfast, and Bob Cobell and Bill Rotar both t gave testimony, and I'm grateful for both of them for their wonderful uh, testimony, not because of what they did, but what Christ has done in their lives and how they were saved and how God led them upon, uh, you know, throughout life. And, and Dr. Bob was sharing about uh, being in the Navy and out on a ship, out at sea and looking out at the stars and how, you know, amazing, you know, the Milky Way is. And not just the Milky Way, everything that we can see. And the further you get out away from the light pollution, you know, you can see certainly more. And right now, the... Images are coming in from the new space telescope, the web, I think it's called, space telescope. And to think, you know, God is omnipresent. He's present there at the same time as he's present here. And not just present, he actually created them. You know, he is the creator of everything and he reigns supreme. I'm on this sermon series dealing with difficult life's difficulties and some of these are life's difficulties some of them as we continue on this sermon series won't have to do specifically with difficult topics but 
um, how, do, how do Christians respond to things in the world? And today it's a little bit of, of both, but I thought I would give a disclaimer. The way I prefer to preach is expository, which is exposing the text. And uh, generally, I like to go verse by verse through different chapters of the Bible and certainly different books of the Bible. As you know, I preach through Romans. I preach through Ephesians here and Galatians and just finished up Genesis chapters 1 through the beginning of chapter 12 and different uh, passages. And I try to, what I like to do as I pick special topics like today's is find a passage or two and speak expository on that on that topic through that passage. And today I really can't do that as much. We're going to include some um, certainly teaching on the passage. Uh, you know, people have a different opinion on expository or exegesis and things like that. And I believe generally the best way to preach is the bulk of your sermon is really going through that passage, walking through that passage. It's not a footnote. And it's not just a springboard or a diving board into your topic, but it is the bulk. And, and we can't always do that, of course, as we deal with topics. But the scriptures always in any sermon are what is most important. And just like, you know, in life, the scriptures are most important in responding to anything that we face. Now, all truth is God's truth. And there's something called the Wesleyan way of reasoning, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. You can look it up later if you want. But basically, um, I like it a lot. Those that have studied John Wesley, the leader of the original Methodist movement, when those that study him would say that his way of reasoning would start with the scriptures on the top. So you have a, something that you have to deal with. Should I buy a new car? Should I buy a used car? You know, whatever. Just pick your, pick your topic, what you're dealing with. You start with what the Bible has to say about it. And the Bible has to say a lot, say, about cars. And you could, the Bible doesn't say whether you should buy a Ford or a Chevy or a Honda, but the Bible does talk about debt and things like that. And so you start with Scripture. And then you add to Scripture, but underneath Scripture. Scripture is most important. So underneath Scripture, you use your reason. God gives us our ability to reason, to think critically. So there's reason, tradition, and experience. So, for example, with experience, I would have to say, I am horrible at working in cars. So if I'm looking into buying a car, I would start with scripture. The Bible is most important. And then experientially, I would be, have to say, I need to buy a car that runs and runs well. Otherwise, I'm going to be bothering other people around me. And then, of course, we add in reason and things like that. And they all work together. But the Bible and what the Bible has to speak to everything in life is most important. And then under that reason, tradition, and experience. Prior to serving as a pastor, I never thought I would have to meet with a couple or talk to a couple and ever recommend divorce. The Bible says that God hates divorce in Malachi 2.16. And in 2006, I was in a seminar on using multimedia in church and, and uh and it also got into uh, what, what software was best and what projectors are best and what do the different abbreviations mean and all that stuff. And they showed a video clip from, I think it's called Hope Floats with Sandra Bullock. I've never actually seen the movie, but I saw the video clip. And, and it's dealing with the divorce and a dad is leaving and a little girl comes out with tears in her eyes. Daddy, don't leave. It's hard for me to even um, say that without even um, thinking tears coming to my eyes. And then they said, Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. I'm going to quote later on C.S. Lewis about how a divorce is more like uh, doing, taking, a, taking a, 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 the legs off a body rather than just doing a surgery for healing or breaking up a business agreement. You know, God hates divorce. However, I've too often sat with couples and thought, well, this should be so easy to work out, but it's not. And that goes along with what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. In Matthew 19, verse 8, which Matthew 19 will be our main text, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, Moses gave the divorce laws because of the hardness of our heart. The hardness of our heart. Hard-heartedness. About divorce, Dallas Willard, the Christian philosopher, shares this position, which is his admittance that sometimes divorce is the best option in a bad situation. 
his admittance that sometimes divorce is the best option in a bad situation certainly represents a change on my part, the Myest Dallas Willard. Willard says, I recall with embarrassment sitting around a seminar table at the University of Wisconsin in the early 1960s. The professor had not yet arrived for our seminar in formal logic, and one of the class members was talking about his divorce proceedings. Without being asked for my opinion, I ventured to say, divorce is always wrong. Looking back on it, he continues, the strangest thing of all was that no one objected to what I said or even to my saying it. Everyone seemed accepting of it. Of course, that was because my words represented a cultural assumption of those days. But in fact, I was vastly ignorant of the things men and women do to one another. Later, I came across a situation of a devout woman whose husband had married her as a cover for his homosexuality. He consummated the marriage so it couldn't be annulled, and after that, he had nothing to do with her. They had no personal relationship at all. He would bring his male friends home and, in her presence, have sex in the living room or wherever else they pleased, any time they pleased. Her religious guides continued to tell her that she must stay in the marriage while she died a further death every day, year after year. Willard sums this section up. I was simply an ignorant young man full of self-righteous ideas. This in later episodes of Discovery educated me in the hardness of the human heart. But Jesus, of course, always knew. Today we deal with a very difficult topic of divorce. How should a Christian respond to divorce? And as some would say, and some of you may be thinking, it doesn't really apply to me. I've been married for 55 years. Not me, but you. I mean, I'm coming up on 20, but not 55. Some of you have been married a very, very long time. My grandparents are, I think, are at 73 years and still living. And that's awesome, and that's a great praise. But regardless of how long we've been married, I would think all of us have been affected by divorce within our family, within our friends, within our children, within our grandchildren. And how should a Christian respond? How can we stand for truth about what the Bible teaches and about the biblical worldview of marriage? And how, what do we do at holidays? And when do we exercise tough love? Or do we exercise tough love? What do we do? How do we counsel our children, our adult children, or adult grandchildren? Dallas Willard mentions that the naivete, he didn't use that word, I will, of what men and women can do to each other. And I've sat with couples, and um, not just at this church, but other churches, and trying to counsel them on marriage. And as anger erupts, and as you hear how one person says one thing and another person says another, and you wonder where the truth is, and we see what Jesus is saying right here in Matthew 19, uh, verse 8, about the hardness of heart. And we wonder, why can't we just humbly speak the truth and speak the, speak the truth in love? And certainly we are all different, and people um, argue differently. The dispersonality profile, Myers-Briggs, and other types of things kind of get into that. But why can't we just cut through that hardness of heart? And, of course, we all have different pasts that we were growing up with. There's a book, um, Your Body Keeps a Score, which I'm going through. I just finished the one I referenced uh, last Sunday that gets into the grooves that are actually literally, physically, literally built into our brain with the things that we go through. And there's a lot of things we have to overcome. So I'm going to say in a little bit that sometimes, unfortunately, divorce is like triage. It's the best in a very bad situation. My theme today is that a Christian should always respond to divorce in love. Now, I'm talking to about responding to divorce. I'm not talking about the covenant of marriage itself. I'm not talking about uh, necessarily the marital counseling process. I'm talking about you get the news. How do you respond? However, I'm going to have to first ground it briefly, ground this sermon in. What does the Bible even say about divorce? When is divorce permitted? And, and I have to say, I do not want this to be a comprehensive study on divorce. I can approach this topic in two ways. One is a message on divorce. When is it permitted, which I just shared, you know, the Matthew 19, 8, you know, Moses wrote the divorce laws because of the hardness of heart. And, of course, I, I'm going to share in a little bit about abandonment and also about adultery. When is it permitted? 
I could focus the whole sermon on that. The second way I can talk about divorce is how can Christians respond to divorce? How can people get help? And I'm going to try to focus on the latter, though it's probably actually going to be end up a 50-50 sermon. We start with what the Bible says and, and then the next step, how do we respond? But how should you respond if your adult children are divorced? And I want to say, and, and the main theme, the main driving home point I want to make is we have to respond in love and grace. And we can do that while still standing on truth. Oftentimes we go to one side or the other. We think by giving grace, we're compromising truth. But John chapter 1, verse 14 says, Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. 100% grace, 100% truth. Jesus did not compromise either. And I believe we can do the same. The Bible mentions and comments about divorce in the following passages. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. Malachi 2.16, Matthew 5.31-32 through 32 in the Sermon on the Mount, Luke 16.18, 1 Corinthians 7.10-16, uh, Mark chapter 10, verses 1-12, through 12, and I want to read Matthew chapter 19, verses 1-9 through 9 at this time. I invite to, you to turn there if you haven't. Some of you might be following in the, in the manuscript. If you're reading in the Pew Bible... I'm going to give you a second to turn there because, as I said, it's what the scriptures say that are always most important. Matthew's gospel gives a little bit of extra information from Mark chapter 10 and some of the other passages. Matthew 19, 1 through 9, which is page 773 in the Pew Bible. Page 773 in the Pew Bible. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went up away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him. They're testing him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Notice how they're saying for any cause, because there were two separate schools on divorce that the rabbis taught. In one school taught that you could divorce your spouse, your wife, it says here, and most of them it was wife in Judaism, for any reason whatsoever. So they're trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to test Jesus. Is it lawful for you to divorce your wife for any cause, for any reason whatsoever at all? Can you divorce your wife? Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away. So remember, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to test him. So they respond. Jesus responds, and Jesus responds by going back to Genesis chapter 2. Have you not read? He's entering. He's going back to the Bible. And Jesus adds a little addendum. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And then they are responding. They're arguing with him. They're, they're, they're testing him uh, further. Why then did Moses command one to get a certificate of divorce? They're going back to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And I want to make a special note here that is very, very, very important. There are many things that we see in the New Testament that we have to go back to the Old Testament to find out the details about. There's some people right now who say things like, we need to unhitch the the New Testament from the Old Testament. We need to get away from the Old Testament. The Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. That is totally not true. When the New Testament talks about sexual immorality, which is a Greek word, pornea, pornea, what the old KJV KJV would say, fornication, we have to go back to Leviticus to to find out what sexual immorality really even was. That's why Leviticus is so important. Dr. Adelnik from Moody wrote an article called uh, Learning to Love God Through Leviticus or something about like that. You know, you have to go back to Leviticus, the law of the Levites. And right here, when it references the certificate of divorce and Moses commanding them to give them a certificate of divorce we have to go back to Deuteronomy 24 to find out what that's all about the Old Testament is so important Uh, the New Testament is is 
filled with Old Testament references. So Jesus said to them, they, they asked Jesus a question, and we come back to verse 8. Because of your hardness, it says he, that's Jesus. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Moses allowed it. Moses didn't encourage it. Moses allowed it. And why did he allow it? Because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. Notice that. Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. That's not the way God intended it from the beginning. And Jesus says in verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So uh, Jesus is adding right here this clause. It's called the exception clause, okay? It's, in, it's, it's here, but it's not in Mark chapter uh, 10, 1 through 12. But it, it's right here, this exception clause. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So that's another step, another type of thing that we can talk about is not just divorce. When is divorce permitted? Permitted, and then when is remarriage permitted? And according to this exception clause, except when there's sexual immorality, it's not right to remarry is what he's saying right here. But he focuses on the hardness of heart. By the way, Mark chapter 10 verses 1 through 12 is almost identical to Matthew's gospel chapter 19, except, except in Mark chapter 10, Mark references when a woman divorces her husband. That was very rare back then, but Mark was written predominantly to a Gentile, a non-Jewish audience, and that could be what's going on there. However, as, I, as I've already mentioned, I don't think I need to say anything about it more. Uh, Matthew's gospel gives that exception clause. And, and in that case, Jesus makes um, the requirement that marriage be lifelong um, because sexual immorality, but, but sexual immorality grievously defiles and corrupts the one flesh union. And in that case, it implies that divorce and remarriage on the grounds of sexual immorality are not prohibited and thus do not constitute adultery. And that's another conversation later on as well if we wanted to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, Paul adds abandonment as a reason for divorce. Abandonment. So we see the idea of hardness of heart, sexual morality. We see the idea of abandonment. And it seems uh, right here that when there is hardness of heart, then divorce is allowed. It's not encouraged. It's allowed, though. It's permitted. Hardness of heart leads to the adultery. And hardness of heart leads to the neglect or the abandonment. The Old Testament divorce laws, as I've already stated, come from Deuteronomy 24. And I want to make a special note right here. Jesus nowhere encourages divorce. It is almost like triage. In bad situations, we must do triage. And divorce is the best in an already complicated and harmful situations. We know what medical triage is like, right? You go to the, you go to the emergency room and you have a fever and, and they say you might have the flu and they tell you be seated and you'll be there, you know, a while. And somebody else comes in and their arm is like, barely hanging on, and they're bleeding out, and their leg is cut off, and they have an arrow sticking out of their eye because they were at a bad Civil War reenactment or something like that. Triage, they're going to get in right away, right? They're going to get in sooner. And sometimes, as Christians, we are doing triage, and, and that's the case with divorce right here. That's what we're talking about. Um, Dr. Al Mohler of Southern Seminary talked about doing theological triage as well. There are some things that, that Christians differ on, but we can still stay united on. You know, I have several quotations in my sermon manuscript about there, this, and I've already summed up the school of Hillel, uh, permitted divorce for any reason. In Hillel, that was a rabbinic school back in that day and age, and it supported divorce for any reason at all whatsoever. And there was another particular school um, that said divorce could only, be, could only happen based off of moral grounds, and that's what Jesus held to. Uh, Rabbi Hakabah even allowed divorce if the husband merely saw a woman whose appearance pleased him better and if he wanted her as a wife instead of the wife he had. Um, Dallas Willard says, in practice, however, a woman knew very well that she could be divorced for any reason her husband chose. The law's practice was entirely 
favorable to the husband's slightest whim, even though the Mosaic codes, chiefly found in De- Deuteronomy 22 through 24, are obviously much more restrictive. The Mosaic law was much more restrictive, but in practice, in the actual life of first century Judaism, the women knew they could be divorced for pretty much anything. One of the rabbinic schools would say if the they even wrote up things, like if your wife burnt the food, you could divorce her, things like that. Uh, divorce in the Old Testament actually would protect the woman. Otherwise, the husband would make life unbearable for the woman and the children. Again, and this is very, very, very interesting, a very good point from Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard writing about the Sermon on the Mount. He says, it is not an accident that Jesus deals with divorce in Matthew 5, 31 through 32, after having dealt with anger, contempt, and obsessive desire. Jesus deals with divorce in the Sermon on the Mount after dealing with anger, contempt, and obsessive desire. Because if you take anger, contempt, and obsessive desire away, how many divorces would actually happen? Very few to none. Willard says, is in divorce ever justifiable for Jesus? I think it clearly is. His principle of the hardness of heart allows it, though his application would require great care. Perhaps divorce must be viewed somewhat as a practice of triage in the medical care. Decisions must be made as to who cannot, under the circumstances, be helped. They are then left to die, so then those who can help, uh, be helped, should live. Uh, divorce, if it were rightly done, would be done as an act of love. It would be dictated by love and done for the honest good of the people involved. Such divorce, though rare, remains nonetheless possible and may be necessary. If it were truly done on this basis, it would be rightly done in spite, in spite of the heartbreak and loss it is sure to involve. And, and Richard Foster shares, when it is clear that the continuation of the marriage is substantially more destructive than a divorce, then the marriage should end. When it is clear that the continuation of the marriage is more destructive than a divorce, then the marriage should end. And then how should Christians respond? Suppose you have a relative going through divorce. How do you respond? And I want to emphasize, I believe, even though I've spent so much time on that, even though I want it to be 50-50, I want to make the driving point home. We need to respond in love and grace. And with compassion. And with forgiveness. This is the case regardless of whether we believe the divorce was permitted or not. We might believe there was adultery present. We might believe there was hardness of heart present. We might believe they were both wrong. We might believe only one of them were wrong. We might believe whatever. But how do we respond? Certainly if they are Christians and if they respect the scriptures, and if you have the opportunity before the divorce to talk to them and encourage them to get marital counseling and encourage them to humbly get help, then definitely do so. But what about after the fact? It's over. It's time to offer support. We must support them. We must love them. Loving them does not mean condoning the divorce, but the divorce is over now. We must encourage others to calm down from vindictive or self-centered, hostile ways of relating. It's already bad. Regardless of what our culture says about divorce, it is hard. I know it's hard. Because regardless of whether marriage is sanctified or not, regardless of whether it's sanctified or not by people, we know based off a biblical worldview when two people come together and when they have life together, and especially when they have children together. But regardless, that's not meant to be broken off in an easy way. It is difficult. And they need support. We must make sure that you forgive your relatives or friends. Forgive. If there are children involved, do not talk negatively about either spouse in front of the children. Divorce affects more than the immediate family, and so I encourage you to be willing to get help. Oftentimes, we're unwilling to get help, right? You know why we're unwilling to get help? Because of hardness of heart. The same, very same reason that Moses permitted, allowed for the divorce laws is the very same reason that regardless of the situation, whether it's overeating or gambling or lust or pornography or whatever our issue is, we're unwilling to get help because of hardness of heart. We need to let go of the hardness of heart. Be willing to get help. Celebrate recovery can help. 
a Christian counselor or friend can help as well. The following is especially helpful for the immediate victims of divorce, but I, I think what I'm about to share applies to all of us, okay? Because we all have friends and family and children and grandchildren who deal with this situation. If we haven't yet, I'm sure that we will, okay? So I think that this applies to all of us. We need to avoid harmful thinking. Avoid making sweeping generalizations about oneself or others. These generalizations may have little or no basis in fact, but they can pull people down. Examples might include... We must avoid saying things like, I'm completely incompetent as a parent. We must avoid things like, my former spouse wants to get even with everybody. Avoid these types of thinking, thinking, uh, this type of thinking. Uh, Avoid developing and anticipating unrealistic expectations. Avoid living out self-fulfilling prophecies. For example, a person may conclude that from now on, my life will be miserable. This attitude in turn can make life miserable in and of itself. And how do you avoid that? Sometimes you need counseling. But sometimes you as a close friend or a parent or a, or a brother or a sister or as a relative, you can encourage them and say, that's unreasonable. And let's try to make our thoughts jump from that and think on positive good things. Avoid always being defensive and expecting the worst. This can lead to behavior that alienates people and brings the worst. Avoid wallowing one's problems talking about them incessantly, and always focusing on the negative. we got to turn to the positive. Do we, I was just reading this last week. Do you know how important thankfulness is to life? You know how important positive thinking is to life? Anytime, anytime, anytime we wallow in the negative, it makes things worse. Turn it to the positive. And we need, this is why it's important for all of us, we need Christian friends to say, to turn it for us right? Because when you're in the middle of something, it's hard. I'm talking about divorce now, but it could be depression. It could be anxiety. We need other people to help us be positive. We need other people to hold up our hands. We need other people to help us out. And that's why I'm focusing on this, even if it doesn't affect you directly. Avoid blaming others persistently, especially one's mate. Avoid rushing to new jobs, new locations, or new churches in an attempt to start fresh, but without careful prior thought to the wisdom of the new moves. Oftentimes things happen and we make rash changes. Don't do that. Avoid living through others, such as finding satisfaction only in one's children or in the achievements of others. Avoid assuming that life only can be meaningful again when there is another marriage. It would make you rush and make rash decisions. I can go on and on about how important it is to get help after you or a relative goes through divorce. I know that this affects extended family as well. For example, what do you do at Thanksgiving and holidays? And I want to reiterate, I believe it is important to try to do the most loving, grace-filled, full of mercy thing possible. I heard once somebody say, mercy is God holding back what we deserve, and grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. God gives us grace, we can give grace to others. God gives us mercy, we can give mercy to others. Remember that. Remember, you may not want to be around someone, but that person is the mother or father of your grandchildren. Try to view it from the children's perspective. I want to say one other thing about that. It truly is true. I said truly is true. That um, there are so many different stories to develop. I've heard from a husband. I've heard from a wife. And then I get together, them together, and you try to balance the story. And so years ago, a long time ago, I had to make a decision. I only talked to the wife about a marriage issue apart from the husband once. And only talked to the husband apart from the wife once. And the rest is, is together because you get he said, she said. And it's really hard to find out where the truth is. Maybe that's where grace comes in. C.S. Lewis writes, Christianity teaches that marriage is for life. There is, of course, a difference here between different churches. Some do not admit divorce at all. Some allow it reluctantly in very special cases. It is a great pity that Christians should disagree about such a question. But for an ordinary layman, the thing to notice is that the churches all agree with one another about marriage a great deal more than any of them agree with the outside world. Lewis continues, I mean, they all regard divorce as something like cutting up a living body as a kind of surgical operation. 
Some of them think the operation of divorce is so violent that it cannot be done at all. Others admit it is, as de- it, it is a desperate remedy in extreme cases. It's a desperate remedy in extreme cases. They, all, they are all agreed that it is more like having both your legs cut off than it is like dissolving a business partnership or even deserting a regiment. Yet it does happen. And that is why we, we, that's why we must exercise love, forgiveness, and grace. And I, and I have to admit before I close this sermon that um, the sermon was originally about three pages longer. So if you think it's too long now, <laughs> I cut it back. I wanted to add a forgiveness pyramid to it, and I took that out. And so I want to give the disclaimer right now. If there are things left where you wish I would have addressed them, I'm glad to talk more. Pastor Bobby Murphy gave one of the greatest messages, or actually there are about two messages on our website still, on divorce that I've ever read, quoting a lot of Dallas Willard that I referenced, and I'd be glad to refer that to you as well. He wrote about when divorce and remarriage is permitted and went into great detail with that as well. Divorce happens. We must offer love and forgiveness and grace. Speaking of love, forgiveness, and grace, before I close in prayer, I got a text during the sermon, and it came through on my iPad, and I guess maybe this is a good case of being distracted a little bit, a Valerie Hammond message that the front of her garage fell in, and she asked, is there anyone that can help? Um, so, and she sent a picture, which I'd be glad to show you afterwards. So if you think you can offer any support for her or maybe stop by and see if you can recommend what she should do, um, I'm glad to give you her number on the way out. And she lives very, very close. So let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord God, right now uh, for those who are victims of divorce. Some, many here directly, and maybe even this sermon uh, brought back hard, hard, hard memories. Maybe some direct, uh, victims through family or through friends or through coworkers or through neighbors. And there's always a question about taking sides and all this other stuff. And what do we do? And Lord God, we just pray for comfort and care and peace for all those hurting right now. Lord God, we can only go through this life with all the trials and tribulations we face through the power of the Holy Spirit within us. We can only go through this life through through the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And so, Lord God, I ask that you help us all the leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on you for help. And many times we are that help to other people. Encouraging them supporting them, trying to help them be positive, trying to help them stay thankful, trying to help them uh, get counseling or celebrate recovery or whatever it might be. And we ask, O oh Lord God, that you can help us as we help others and help us when we need help as well. And Lord God, I pray for Valerie right now as, uh, as I know that uh, her garage has fallen in and she needs major construction help, it seems. And so we pray your help and support on Valerie. We pray your blessings and care as we close this service. In Jesus' name, amen. The altars are open once again. And if God has laid anything in your heart, and again, it might be for a family member or a friend. It may not be for you specifically. It might be for someone else. Come on up and pray, and we'd be glad to pray with you. If you're able to stand with us as we sing, I surrender all.
Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, may we surrender everything to you. Lord, our attitude, our pride, whatever we have within us, Lord, that is hindering our relationship with you or those around us, Lord, I pray that we would surrender that to you today. Lord, I pray your blessings upon each one that is in this place today, those that may be watching by live stream. Lord, may we realize that you love us so much. Lord, I don't think we comprehend the love that you have for us. Lord, may we come to understand and realize that there is nothing, nothing that we can do that can separate us from that love and we are so thankful for that we give you praise and glory for this time that we've had together we ask it in jesus name amen I surrender. 